So I'm Jamie Kearney, and I'm, as you've heard, I'm the Administrative Coordinator with Inside Out Reentry, and I'm very pleased to introduce to you Heather Irwin. Heather is the director of the University of Iowa's Liberal Arts Beyond Bars College and Prison Program, and she is a senior advisor to the Institute of Higher Education Policy. Heather is an education specialist and criminal justice reform advocate, promoting access to higher education as a core element of success for people who are incarcerated. She has participated in a number of Department of Education, White House and foundation sponsored conferences, summits and working groups focused on advancing the delivery of high quality education content to incarcerated students and providing tools to help navigate the reentry process. Heather is also the co-founder of the nonprofit Unlocking Education Inc and co-author of the Department of Education sponsored policy brief Education, Technology, and Corrections, published in 2015. Heather is a graduate of the University of Iowa College of Law and North Central University. Finally, Inside Out Reentry is very lucky and honored to have Heather as a, board, as a member of its board of directors since, I believe, 2015. I know she was on the board when I started back in 2016, so she's been on the board of the directors now for many years and helped the organization grow and thrive. And so please join me in welcoming Heather Irwin. Hi, good afternoon. I get the after lunch group. I was thinking I should make you get up and do jumping jacks or something. <laughs> Maybe like if I see heads nodding, we'll do that later. Um, okay, I am very happy to have the opportunity to talk to you today about the trajectory of higher education in prison and also to share some information about our local college and prison program, the University of Iowa Liberal Arts Beyond Bars. Um, do we have the wider net slide up? We'll go next slide. We'll get the hang of this. I was first introduced to the idea of education in the context of incarceration when I went to work for the wider net project here on campus about 10 years ago. My job for WiderNet was to promote the idea of using an offline collection of educational resources developed by WiderNet founder Cliff Misson and called the e-granary in correctional facilities. So the granary in African cultures is where you store the seeds for next year's harvest. So this was the seeds of knowledge for the future. More specifically, we worked in prison classrooms. During the time I worked for Cliff and the WiderNet project, I presented the platform at conferences of educators working in correctional facilities, bless you, and had conversations with many people dedicated to opening doors to educational opportunities for incarcerated people around the country. One of those people was Fred Patrick. You can go to the next slide. The director of the Center on Sentencing and Corrections for the Vera Institute of Justice. Fred actually passed away earlier this year. So that's his memorial photograph. He was foundational in creating the current movement we have toward expanding access to higher ed in prison across the country. Fred eventually invited me to join his team of people providing training and technical assistance for colleges and universities chosen to participate in the U.S. Department of Education's Second Chance Pell Experimental Sites Initiative. This Experimental Sites Initiative seeks to examine the value, specifically the value as measured in recidivism reduction, which we might talk about later, uh, of reinstating Pell Grants for incarcerated students enrolled in college-level classes while they're serving time in state or federal prisons. So as the housing panel talked about earlier when the Obama administration offered clarification on what landlords, when landlords can deny or are mandated to deny access, the Obama administration similarly offered clarification to the fact that students incarcerated in jails and juvenile correctional facilities are not prohibited from having access to Pell Grants under the 94 ban. So it's just state and federal prisons. Um, I don't think I have another slide yet. So I'm gonna give you a little bit more background here. We'll go ahead to the next slide. The federal Pell Grant program was authorized in 1972. It was designed to provide financial aid for education for low income undergraduate students, including students who are in prison. By the early 90s, there were more than 770 post-secondary programs in nearly 1,300 prisons. 770 programs 
in 1,300 prisons. The 1980s brought us Just Say No, rising crime rates across the country, predicated the tough on crime approach that was codified in three strikes laws and other punitive legislation. And in 1994, you have heard it said repeatedly across these last two days, Congress passed the Comprehensive Violent Crime Control you, and Law Enforcement Act. This omnibus crime bill also revoked Pell Grant eligibility for incarcerated students. As a result, those 770 post-secondary programs for incarcerated students primarily funded by Pell Grants vanished, and you heard Sean talk last night, literally overnight. By the next year, 1995, there were, how many people want to guess? The remaining number of, of college and prison programs, 1995, the year, post, one year post omnibus crime bill. Seven. Seven. So for the last 25 years, there's been no clear, reliable funding source for higher education programming taking place in the carceral space. There has, however, been a slow renaissance, very slow as we know is often the case, of smart on crime policies that recognize that educational opportunities not only lead to skills and therefore better jobs upon release, but also to safer facilities, better relationships in communities, both inside and outside of prisons and jail cells. In 2015, the U.S. Department of Education announced the creation of an experimental sites initiative called Second Chance Pell. Second Chance Pell allows incarcerated students from the 67 chosen colleges and universities to draw down Pell funds for post-secondary educational attainment. The project launched in the fall of 2016, and its benefits have already been made clear. Anecdotal reporting shows Increases in employment for students have been able to access Pell in order to complete college programs while incarcerated. Other tangential benefits are increased safety and security within their facilities, better relationships between incarcerated students, their friends and family, and expressions of higher job satisfaction by corrections staff and officers. In 2015, Senator Brian Schatz from Hawaii introduced the REAL Act, which is an acronym for, let's see, Restoring Education and Learning. Um, the bill's a simple one. Its only purpose is to lift the ban on Pell Grant eligibility for incarceration, incarcerated students. The bill didn't gain traction preliminarily during its first introduction, but it was reintroduced um, earlier this year with much better backing. It currently enjoys bipartisan and bicameral support and sponsorship, which means it's supported by both political parties and in both houses of Congress. This is a big deal, especially in this climate. Senator Lamar Alexander of Tennessee also just introduced what he's titled a micro reauthorization of the Higher Education Act, which addresses funding rules for all higher education institutions. Within his micro bill, Senator Alexander included reinstatement of Pell Grant eligibility for incarcerated students. This provides another avenue for funding and another platform from which to tout the value of access to education for incarcerated learners. One caveat is that Alexander's bill lifts the ban, uh, but keeps in place the requirement that students are eligible for release at some point, which means that students with a life without parole sentence are ineligible. This activity at the federal level is feeding the renaissance I referred to earlier. Outside of policy settings and lawmaking, there are also efforts underway at the national level to create frameworks for what the best college and prison programs look like. What characteristics do quality programs share? And you can go to the next slide. The Lumina Foundation recently funded a comprehensive report co-authored by the Alliance for Higher Education in Prison, the Prison University Project, which is out of San Quentin Prison in Northern California, and the Freedom Education Program, that program's out of Seattle, Washington. The report highlights the need for comprehensive program design, the importance of strong partnerships with departments of corrections and collaborations with community-based organizations like Inside Out. Further, the report makes recommendations about faculty recruitment, training, supervision, I'm looking at Heidi, within a carceral setting and provides suggestions around curriculum development, pedagogical approaches, instructional resources, and the provision of student advising and support services. Go to the next slide. Additionally, organizations like the Institute for Higher Education Policy, uh, for whom I also work, was primarily focused, whose primary focus is on advancing equity and success, for underserved student populations has taken an interest in supporting the quest for quality in higher education and prison programs. 
IAP is currently engaged in research to identify the key performance indicators of quality in college in prison programs, and the UI Lab program is participating in and contributing to this important research. UI Lab has been able to capitalize on the momentum generated by the increased focus on advancing access to higher ed for incarcerated students, as well as on the preliminary successes chronicled by schools engaged in the Second Chance Pell Experimental Sites Initiative. We've now been offering courses for credit at the Iowa Medical and Classification Center for nearly three years. So my original intention today was to have students join us virtually from the prison, but we were unfortunately unable to do that. So the next best thing, and thank goodness for the ingenuity <laughs> of people who are in prison, because they threw together for me very quickly this 12-minute video that I would like to share. Um, they prepared, so Mitchell Barda was the producer of this video. Um, I had a group of students I asked if they would speak for you, and Mitchell was originally on that invite list, but he chose to remain behind the camera, so he's the voice <laughs> off camera asking questions. Um, so this is about 12 minutes long. to follow through with that. Um, and I felt that, you know, attaining an education would help me with that. Honestly, it would have to be just an interest in growth. I have been 
going through a whole transition of doing better for myself, being involved in other things, and coming to this facility allowed me to see what's available and kind of broaden my my views of what I really want to do with myself. And so with that, what brought you to the process of changing? That's a tough one. Um, I was just tired of living the way I used to live. Um, I wasn't always a nice person. I wasn't always, you know, a helpful person. And I was tired of that. You know, I went through a lot of circumstances where, you know, it didn't make me a better person. And so the fact that, you know, I was able to join the program, the VAP program at that, um, it really helped with my development, you know, and trying to progress and be a better man. This is where I think that I was maybe a little bit different from all the other students in that it wasn't, there was never um, a choice to change. It wasn't like, hey, I'm doing this to change. It was initially just something to do. And it was something to keep me out of Fort Madison. However, since then, <laughs> it's now that I realize exactly what I'm capable of and the support that I have, it is now, uh, it's been a comfortable decision. But it had, I had to realize first that number one, I am a human. Number two, I'm a capable human. And number three, that I have a lot to offer the world. Oh, it, it couldn't have changed more. Like I said earlier on, I was a skeptic and now I'm, uh, I'm a firm believer that not only is it possible, it's likely that I'll get a degree. And um, I think What's more impactful than all that is how it has changed my behavior um, during class, with teachers, with other professionals that come into the institution, and also with my behavior just as a man in prison and as a man with family. Uh, it's changed my behavior in a ton of different ways. So. I was tired of the same. I was stuck in an endless cycle of repeating the, the same things that I've been doing for the last 10 years. And I knew that I wanted something different. I knew that if I didn't pursue something different, I would end up being in a worse situation. I already have a long enough sentence. I did not want to add to that. <clears throat> To be more involved with social work. It's something that has kind of opened up since I've been involved and the more I get to be interactive with other people and see what the real issues are that we have in here, I want to find ways that I can better help others that could either possibly end up in here or are getting out and help them transition into a better reentry. So, you know, God willing, if I can earn my bachelor's degree, I eventually want to open up my own tattoo shop. I'm a great artist, you know, I have a lot of potential, and I feel like there's a way for me to be able to help others as well. You know, if I can open up my own shop, I can employ others that are in similar situations and help them get a job, you know. Well, uh, for now, I want to further my education. I want to. Uh, I think I have 50 credits, so I want to get my associate's degree. Um, and then potentially, I have enough time left in prison, I, I, I'm pretty sure I can get a bachelor's degree if it's offered. Uh, so those are you know two, three, four, five year goals. Past that, uh, I'm hoping to turn this into a career or at least opportunity for advancement. So, I mean, there's, there's a lot of options. It's, it's giving me some I think the biggest thing for us is support. Um, if we can have your support, if we can have your encouragement, if we can have you be there for us in various ways, like the professor from the University of Iowa have been, um, and that would be awesome. You know, that helps us move forward. That helps us create a bond. That helps us learn and. It's very beneficial to us growing as a person. <coughs>
So thank you for your support. There is there is an answer to, to your guys' problems, to your guys' issues, to this whole mass incarceration dilemma. There is a there is an answer to it. It's seemingly right in front of their faces. <clears throat> for whatever reason, political, financial, um, they seem to ignore it. This opportunity should be available across the board. What we have done at INCC and what is, was done before I even got here is amazing. It should be the blueprint for corrections. And, you know, you can put all this money into all these treatment programs that just don't work. Or you can hire, uh, you know, a person like Heather Irwin, and she will impact 300 people's lives. So education is the route. It is the answer to the mass incarceration epidemic. I think something that gets missed in all of this is because they shut it down for 20 years. So I think the most important takeaway for me so far and what I, would, what I would want people to know about is that you have to give it a chance. I think the longer that, the, that this program and programs like it exist, the more you'll see how valuable they are. But it takes time, like with, with most things that are this big takes time to see. So I would say my message would be give it time. Give it a minute. That's a big question. I would have to say in order for us in here to do something different, we have to know and feel that we're being given an actual chance because so many times when efforts are made by us or, or whether it be by others, there's always a hesitation or an expectation of failure. And because of that, we tend to just revert back to the old ways. And knowing that we have a chance and people are willing to kind of bet on us, that's a, that's a big thing for me. So Reborn Studios is Mitchell Barda, who's in the entrepreneurial program at Tippy and wants to do this when he is outside. Um, so I, the only thing I asked was, can you put a video together for me? <laughs> so that's what we got. Um, so I guess one thing, so I'm, I'm gonna transition and talk a little bit about the lab program. Um, but I, I do wanna say there are a couple of things happening that Inside Out's a part of, that the lab pro program is a part of, um, that are also kind of happening at the national level, and that's as students progress through college and prison programs, they are finding their voices, and there's a nothing about us without us movement. Rich, Harold, 
right? You can't, we can't find solutions to these problems without asking the people that are directly impacted. So um, I'm glad I was disappointed that we didn't have the technology. <laughs> I was gonna be so impressive and zoom them in. <laughs> but second best thing. Um, so, and I think we're okay. Uh, I do wanna have time for questions too. Um, but the, so the lab program has been offering credits to the men at IMCC Oakdale since fall 2017. Preliminary course offerings, as, as most of the guys in the video referred to, um, was a speaker series designed to offer students an introduction to liberal arts and to recruit faculty interested in teaching at the prison. Okay. <laughs> the 24 students enrolled in the first speaker series earned two semester hours of credit for the university, from the University of Iowa's University College. They were enrolled as non-degree seeking students and then that created their eligibility for additional course offerings and we had art history, open art studio, intro to psych that Heidi taught, um, a couple of rhetoric classes that were developmental reading and writing classes, writing for success, reading, writing and public speaking. Um, and then in the next semester, a second, in the next semester and the next semester, a second and third speaker series and we had 33 and 36 students enroll respectively in those um, series. We also offered, um, well, let's see, um, interest on behalf of both students and faculty has continued to grow, as has the breadth of courses that we have been able to offer um, as part of the lab program catalog. In conjunction with the above enrollments, um, we are currently piloting a pathway to the Bachelor of Liberal Studies. So Matt's comment, if it's offered, is a response to the fact that we have been, and I will talk a little bit about our, our partners, um, we've been able to enroll students in an online uh, associate's degree granting um, community college that is one of the, that is Iowa's only second chance Pell site. Um, but we had a technical breach at one of the other prisons that caused their response of removing all access for all prisons. So Matt was actually set to complete his associate's degree in December, but now that might get pushed. Um, so was ready to enroll in the BLS program. So they all do a good job of, I was talking, I can't remember who I was talking to in the back, um, but I, it's so hard to continue to say, I'm working on it. <laughs> They're like, mm-hmm, <laughs> we know. <laughs> Everybody's working on it. Um, but. The Bachelor of Liberal Studies degree um, is, is the bachelor's degree, the four-year degree under the university college, which is one of the 26 colleges of the university. Uh, it is currently an online program and we're in the process of um, creating uh, courses that can be delivered in person that fulfill the requirements of that degree program. The goal is to provide a feasible pathway uh, and we would incorporate the Iowa Central Community College Associates degree partnership, and we are currently working on an additional partnership with Kirkwood. We would love to model Sean Pika's Hudson Link program and just have a delivery system across the state. Um, but the, the goal is to deliver both in-person and online classes, um, incorporating robust academic advising, providing quality uh, qualifying enrolled students the opportunity con to continue their academic journey as students on the University of Iowa campus once they're released from incarceration. And we have two current applicants. Um, a student of Heidi's at Kirkwood has applied and been, been denied admission. The University of Iowa still has the felony conviction box on their application. Um, and we have been able to enroll students in the non-degree seeking program to get around that. Um, until I had a conversation with Bruce Harold, and he said, which is the University of Iowa's president, and he said, have they served their time? I said, yes. <laughs> and he said, well, then I think they should be able to come to class. But that directive <laughs> still has to make its way through all of the um, academic Yes, <laughs> but we're in the process of doing that. So hopefully we have a student um, who just graduated from Iowa Central's program at the Fort Dodge facility who has applied 
to come on campus in the spring, and that's the second application. So we're really hoping that that, yes, all the fingers crossed. Um, so let's see. Um, I have behind me some of the courses that were offered, and you can go on to the next slide too. These are some of the courses that were offered in the 2018, 2019 academic years. Um, I think you guys have a pretty good overview of the Iowa system, Iowa Medical and Classification Center, one of nine prisons in Iowa DOC. Um, 12,000 beds in the prison, but only 300 men are actually assigned to the general population, so that's where we draw our eligible students from. Um, we have at any given time had about 100 of those students enrolled. I think we're about 70 now. And that's split between the Iowa Central Community College online courses. We have 41 students enrolled in that program. We have 49 students enrolled in UI Lab classes offered by Iowa faculty. And there is some crossover between those guys. So I, I'm guesstimating 70. I should probably know for sure. Um, but uh, so the class, medical and classification center means that the other 900 beds are taken up by people that are getting classified to go through and, and then get sent to the prison at which they'll serve the remainder of their sentence in the state. Um, then also we have the hospice program and the hospital program because of our proximity to the University of Iowa Hospital. Um, we actually have the highest high school equivalency rate in our general population. Across the country, it's about 50% of people in prison have their high school equivalency or their diploma. At uh, IMCC, it's 85%. Um, and that is because our population is fair. This, I said this the other day to somebody, and um, as we were talking also about the impenetrable firewall <laughs> that DOC is proposing to build so that we can get our IT access back, I said oxymoron. And then I said, <laughs> now I just forgot my other oxymoron. That was my first oxymoron. Oh, destination prison is the second oxymoron, which IMCC is in the state system considered a destination prison. <laughs> because it, it's got lots of wonderful programs. It has the college program. So um, I did also want to touch on the fact that we do have the partner as Joel touched on wanting to start his own business. Um, we are partnering with the uh, Tippy College of Business to offer um, for incarcerated students who have completed at least 30 hours of post-secondary work. So that doesn't have to be in the college and prison program. If they transfer in credits, that's fine. And we're in the process of doing that, making sure we have everybody's uh, outstanding credits across whatever post-secondary institutions they may have participated in previously to get them back at the University of Iowa so we can have a good understanding of what they have left to get to their degree. So we have lots of students with some credit, no degree, and no clear pathway. Um, and that's where the academic support comes in and counseling. Um, but it, for students that have 30 hours of post-secondary coursework, they can uh, enroll in the Certificate of Entrepreneurship, which is an 18 credit hour course an 18 credit hour certificate program designed around entrepreneurship and innovation uh, culminates in a credential that can be applied toward work in the business major. Um, it also is a good certificate to have for students who want to go on to the MBA program, of which we have a couple. Um, the University of Iowa's online learning platform is run through Canvas, which is called the Learning Management System, and incorporates Zoom meetings uh, to deliver live real-time lectures. So, They've, what we do is um, sit in the classroom that we, ha we had, I'm gonna use past tense for the time being, a uh, connected computer in the multi-purpose room, which is our college classroom, where I could log into my icon site, and do you guys, so this is ironic also, uh, the prison's communication system is called ICON, as is the University of Iowa's learning management system. Okay, um, so, we have the certificate program offered now where I can pop up ICON, we can open the lecture and students can participate um, in a remote access class. So we have guys, Zamora has been through four of those classes, so he's got three or four remaining. Um, I'm trying to figure out what I can get out. <laughs> um, so it's, it's, um, it's actually just a wonderful program to start to integrate in actual student choice to what we're offering, um, which is one of the other goals, right? Like we have a lot of 
programs, especially at the national level, that, that dictate this is what you have. And any post-secondary access that students had, um, even up to the last, and most access that comes through departments of corrections is directed. Here's access to welding, here's access to culinary arts, supply chain management, carpentry, the stuff that we know you can go out and get an apprenticeship in and an eventual job in. There's not a lot of choice in that. We don't assess guys and say, you have these particular skills that will make you a good welder. And we don't ask them whether they wanna be a welder. We say, you're in the welding program. So one of the goals of this program is to, is to provide options so that people, and Matt Henger was one of the first students to say to me, I was so excited to bring in the online program and to have a computer lab where guys could engage in learning together online and to be able to talk in a community. And he said, that's gonna be so loud. Like it would be so great to just have a station in a single room where I could just be the only one in there. And I was like, oh crap. <laughs> but he was, he actually now they have, they were distributed tablets. Um, and he comes into the lab now all the time because <laughs> he likes the community. Um, but so we're learning as we go. Um, and there's a lot of good things happening, even though uh, we've had this this minor setback. I was describing to somebody, um, I was able to go to Attica TEDx um, in New York la last week, and um, they asked what kind of programs we were running, and I, I said, I think like most of these kinds of programs, as long, you're, you're, you can measure progress as long as you're taking two steps forward and only one step back, as opposed to one step forward, two steps back. So. I don't know that that's necessarily the expectation I want to continue, but for now, it's progress. Um, so with that, I will. Actually, I did want to do one more thing, sorry. Um, we did apply for Second Chance Pell expanded, so they expanded the initiative from the 67 original sites. Um, and we were able to submit an application. We do also expect that Higher Ed Act or the Real Act or the Trone Bill, which all incorporate passage of our lifting of the ban on Pell Grant eligibility. So Matt Hedinger, who you saw, uh, wrote a letter in support of our application. He said, my name is Matthew Hedinger, and I am writing this letter in support of the University of Iowa's Liberal Arts Beyond Bars program and for the expansion of Second Chance Pell funding. I'm currently incarcerated in an Iowa prison and have been for nearly 12 years. For my first 10 years in prison, I wanted to pursue an education, but could not due to a lack of options and the prohibitively high cost. So I did what most prisoners do, I read everything I could get my hands on. And that reading was an education of sorts, but not a formal one, and it was nothing compared to what the lab program has become. My first look at what the lab program had to offer came in the first iteration of what they called a speaker series, which is a series of lectures given on a variety of topics by different university professors who specialize in that particular field. Just listen to the language. It was nine weeks long, one lecture per week, with some reading and writing assignments to assess the interest and ability levels. During this first month, during these first months, an the enthusiasm for this program exploded on both the inmate side and among the faculty. As an inmate who participated, I experienced it like an invigorating shot of life. I felt like an actual human being again, with one, one with value and worth. Since that initial, initial speaker series, the entire environment in this prison has changed dramatically for the better. The interactions between inmates, both with other inmates and with staff, have improved, while disciplinary events and negative occurrences have decreased. With all the new and positive activities available through the lab program, the overall ambiance of the prison has taken on a much more hopeful feeling. It's now a safer place for inmates to live and, a safe, and safer for correction staff to work. For me though, there's a form, far more powerful outcome at play because of what the lab program has offered, hope. For the first time in my incarceration, maybe my entire life, I'm hopeful about my future. I've acquired 50 semester hours and will be graduating with my Associates of Arts degree in December. With continued funding from Pell, I'll be able to pursue my bachelor's degree during the remainder of my incarceration. For the first time in my life, I'm hopeful that I'll be able to enter the professional workforce as a valuable and educated employee. The lab program has expanded my perspectives in many ways and it has truly changed my life for the better. Do we have time for questions? Uh, she'd like to know when um, they're going to bring programs like this into the women's prison. Yep, so DMAC, Des Moines Area Community College, has programs at Mitchellville. Um, Rachel Williams, who will be on the uh, panel following, um, also does programming at Mitchellville. I call it programming. I know that's not the word they like the best. Um, 
but so Mitchellville actually has some of this programming. They also ha now have Iowa Central. So they have associate's degree granting programs. Grinnell College, which is a four-year private school, is also bringing classes in, but they are bringing in general education requirements that will reverse credit transfer back to DMAC so they can get their associates. Um, so again, with this, this uh, concept revisioning, we'll go, I'll go with Mitchell's language, um, the idea would be that we would be able to uh, use adjuncts from DMAC to offer University of Iowa credit and extend programming out to that facility. Yes, follow up. She asked, will that be available to everyone? Because when she was there, the, the college programs are only available for people with long sentences, long mandatory, long mandatory minimums, and, and, with life, life with and with life with no parole. So as with any partnership, it's a compromise, right? So our only eligibility requirement is that you have your high school equivalency. Um, the community colleges are open enrollment, so same for them, and you can actually enroll as a dual enrollee without your high school equivalency as long as you're working on both at the same time. Um, but if leadership at Mitchellville required, set in place different eligibility requirements, then we would negotiate with them. But that would not be my choice to have it restricted in that way. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it, oh, you let me just repeat that quick. Um, how many instructors do they have um, in the fall and how long is the course? How many instructors in the institution? How many instructors are there in the institution? That go into the institution yeah, to teach? Stuff, sure, um, Heidi is one, so let's count. Heidi, Helen, Elena, Caroline, <laughs> Jenny, uh, Alberto. Is that it? Six. <laughs> I think six. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, and we have actually John, yes. We have law seminar. So we had six, five law school faculty who are coming in to do a seminar series. Gina House Connect is a co-college faculty that's working as an adjunct teaching an intro to graphic narrative also. How many of that is? Over 10. Um, what was the other part? How long is the course? There's semester length. So uh, contact uh, hours at the University of Iowa are 12.5 per one credit hour. So if we have a three credit hour course, oh God, I just have to do math. 20, 24, <laughs> 37, 36 and a half, is that right? 36 and a half? Yeah, 37. <laughs> I actually English think major. we have time for one more question if anyone has another question. Yes. Yep. Sure. I'm right. just going to repeat it really quickly. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, what programs did you uh, model this on based w across what's going on nationally? Right. So I was lucky enough to be fairly uniquely positioned, having done some of this work at the national level, to look at prisons like Hudson Link uh, and what Sean's doing and what Daniel Karpowitz and Max Kenner are doing at BPI, um, what Jody Lewin is doing at uh, Prison University Project in San Quentin, um, and to think Think about, and honestly, I don't know that that's necessarily always been beneficial because it's, it's a lot. I like the idea of radical inclusivity that is not the BARD model, that's the Prison University model and the Hudson Link model, um, which allows for the development of participation for a broad range of students and a broad range of skill levels, a broad range of um, abilities and interest levels and it allows people to drop in and out and it allows people to be non-degree seeking and it allows people to decide that they want to change course. Um, equal, that's no, not equal justice initiative, what's the Rebecca Ginsburg's in Illinois? Similarly, um, similarly open. Um, so we have drawn from lots of those different pieces. Part of my work with the Vera Institute uh, in training and technical assistance for Second Chance Pell was I got to go in and look at the ways that people were um, 
leveraging the university's financial input. So that's also been really helpful to figure out how do we pay an adjunct. If we're not going to pay an adjunct, how do we off ask for them to teach on load through the department um, or get a release for them to teach overload um, and things like that. So I think yes was the short answer. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Heather. I really appreciate it.